Hi, everyone. My name is Priya Thalpreth. And I'm Anna Dean. And we are the co-founders of Loud Women, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering young women. We seek to help girls take action to address issues of inequity, encourage girls to build confidence by joining speech and debate programs, provide the tools and resources required for inclusive education, and connect girls with powerful women who inspire leadership. Welcome to Loud Women's first speaker series, Outspoken. We created this series to encourage discussions about important social issues, and throughout the series, we will be discussing diversifying education, voter education, how coronavirus is impacting different demographics, and intersectional feminism. Today, we will be talking to Shelby Oliver, a teacher at Don Tyson School of Innovation in Springdale, Arkansas, about diversifying education and encouraging new perspectives in the and So this is Shelby Oliver. And so we're just going to start off um, asking Shelby to introduce herself and just tell us more about who she is. Yeah, um, so like Anna said, my name is Shelby Oliver. Um, I uh, am a teacher. I just got to relocate back to Northwest Arkansas from Central Arkansas, where I've been um, living and teaching for the past couple of years. And so uh, my husband and I and our two little, little dogs just moved back to Northwest Arkansas uh, to be closer to family and um, kind of come home. This is where I was raised. So yeah, we're super excited to finally be home a little bit. Thank you, Shelby. So could you tell us a little bit about what you teach? Yeah, so um, my first year teaching, I started off teaching U.S. government. Um, and then my second year, we switched from U.S. government to civics, which is similar, but a little bit different. And then I also picked up uh, AP Human Geography um, this past year. So that's what I've been teaching. Awesome. So why did you get into teaching? So uh, my mom was an educator. She's been a teacher for 30 years. And so I really grew up in school, running up and down the hallways. Um, and so that was kind of all I really knew. Um, and it was something I always knew I was really comfortable with. And I was really um, comfortable in a classroom. I really liked being in a classroom. Um, and then thankfully, when I got to be a, a teenager, I started doing a little bit of practicing here and there and uh, realized like, okay, this is what I'm super, super passionate about. Um, and I feel like it's it's, I feel like I'm making a difference in a little bit of ways I can here and there. And so that's kind of what led me to do it. Amazing. So what do you think your goals are as a teacher? My, like my personal goal just within teaching is to, I guess, like never stop being a learner. I did it because I, I really enjoyed being a student. I always um, like liked to go to school, which some students cannot resonate with, but um, I always really enjoyed that. And so my goal is to always be open to, to learning more and to growing more and never feeling like, okay, I've got it down. Like, let's stay, let's stay right here. I want to always push myself. But um, my goal, I guess, for kind of, I guess, like the kind of teacher I am is I always want kids to like feel like if they come in my classroom or they come in my presence or whatever, I always want them to feel like safe. And, yeah, and that kind of seems a little bit, I don't know, cliche, I guess, but um, I don't know. I always, I hope that kids know like I love them and whether or not I say it to them or they can just feel it by the way I interact with them. I just want them to always feel comfortable, safe. I want them to feel heard. So. Do you think Arkansas's curriculum for classes includes a diverse scope of perspectives? And sh a super short answer, no. <laughs> um, I think, I, and I kind of get to, I've had the opportunity to compare it. Um, my civics and my government class that curriculum comes from the state of Arkansas. And then my AP class does not come from the state of Arkansas. And so I, I see a huge divide. And I also see a huge divide in uh, the growth of my students a little bit with um, like how their perspective on the world changes a little bit based on the fact that my normal, my civics and government classes never asked me to, to use a diverse scope of perspectives, but my, my AP class encouraged it and it almost mandated it. Um, and so I saw those kids just grow so much in, in how, how they thought about the world. Um, so in short. How much freedom do you have within the curriculum to include your own resources in the classroom? I would say that teachers have a lot of freedom to do that, um, but the freedom to do it doesn't mean that you have the time or the actual resources to do it. Um, I would say if you if you had a million hours in the day, it's total. It, you have the freedom to do it. But um, I mean, and so I do social studies, and we all know that 
the social studies, the history, the perspectives that we have that are ready available aren't very diverse, right? We, they all come from white men. Um, and so you're really limited and especially young teachers, you are doing all you can just to keep your head above water. And so you really don't have time to go on a, on a crazy hunt for um, diverse perspectives, but Technically, yeah, we do have the freedom to do that. So how do you think the curriculum is flawed through the lens of diversity? Like what specifically? It's never required of a teacher to do it any differently. And it's, and it's definitely, we're not given any resources to do it differently. And so um, I, I just, I don't think that that's something that is a teacher's, like, I don't think it should be totally left up to teachers to figure that piece out when we have a million other pieces going on at the same time. I think that that's something that our, our state and our education departments, that that's something that they could do to help teachers. It's always kind of this question of like, well, what can we do to make your job easier? Or, or like, how can we help teachers? Like, I think that's a great place to start with helping teachers is help them like make, make their, make their class make sense to everybody, not just the white kids in class, not just the male kids in the class. Like, let's make this look like everybody. So, going on to that, what do you think the impact of teaching in a predominantly white community has had on your students? So, I think that um, when not when you don't try to think outside of the box with what you're given, I think it's really hard for kids in a predominantly white community to even begin to look at different perspectives if it's not if it's not really pushed by the teacher um i think it i think it's really detrimental for the the white students because they're not pushed to think anything or see anything differently than they know but even more like the the way worse side of it is it's so unfortunate for minority students is because they are they are never shown anything that looks like them that sounds like them that can resonate with with their actual life um, and so I like so this past year when I taught AP I think it was so just like literally it, one of those like ah teaching moments is I had a student she came up to me at the end of a um, like a religions unit and so we've been going over all the major world religions and we've done like some dig like some digging on them and she she was like how is this not required for everybody to take this class like how it, how is it, how is that not required? Like, I feel like I understand people so much better than I used to. Like, right? <laughs> and so, like, she, we live in the Bible belt of the country, and no one had ever spoken to her about any other religion other than Christianity. And so, to see, like, the light bulb go on in her head, and, like, I'm thinking about people that are different than me, like, you know, check. Thank you. I can go home tonight and sleep well, so... So how do you go about implementing these diverse perspectives in your classroom? Um, if you have any specific books, podcasts, videos, um, or just topics you like to bring up that aren't necessarily in the curriculum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the best thing, and this isn't anything crazy specific, but I think allowing conversations to happen within students, not as much like teacher to student, I think allowing students to talk to each other and teaching them how to talk to each other, that's the best resource I could ever give. Um, and like earlier in the um, what we were actually learning about that day, and that just goes to prove that like what we were learning about was not significant in relation to what these kids wanted to talk about. Normally I'd be like, hey, you're off topic. I kind of heard these kids over there talking about something and my initial instinct was like, hey, get to work, what are y'all doing? But I kind of started to listen and they were talking about LGBTQ plus rights and marriage and all the, and so I kind of like just listened a little bit and they were just talking and they were being so civil and they were not agreeing, but they were being so civil. And so I pulled up a chair and was like, I'm just here to listen. They were like, oh, sorry. And I was like, no, no, please, like, please continue. I would love for you guys to continue this conversation. Um, they didn't finish their work that day. I did not care, right? Because like, I felt like if kids, feel like they can start talking about hard things and different perspectives. And there was a girl in the group who was like, I can speak to this. Like, this is how, like, I am a member of this community and I feel like I have some insight. So can I, can I explain to you like why I feel that way? And like my experiences, that's worth it. I showed up class down one time because a, a student 
somebody had said, well, you're a Mexican. And he was like, well, like, I'm actually not from Mexico. Um, and so like, that actually kind of hurts my feelings. Can I tell you why? And they were like, well, yeah, I guess. And so again, shut down class because that's an important conversation. We should be talking about that. We should encouraging, be encouraging kids to talk about that. So that's the best resource I like to use is just like, if kids feel like they can talk about it, let's talk about it. So. So are there any specific activities, materials, or resources that you use to like help foster that environment in the classroom and allow people to talk about their different perspectives? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I think obviously like being really, really on top of um, the types of like, uh, I guess like articles or news sources that you're giving kids, making sure that those are reliable and that they're scholarly and not political, I guess, um, making sure that like you're teaching kids to look at things that, that like these are facts and let's go off of facts. Um, we used a really cool website in AP Human Geography called imamigrant.org. It's really cool. We did, but we were talking about population and migration and I had the kids pick a migrant. And so the website's really awesome. You type in like, I'm looking for a story from somebody who has migrated from India to Germany. And that pulls up all of these stories of people who have written down and told their accounts of what it was like to migrate from place A to place B. And so I had all the students pick a person that they were going to try to embody. And so they analyzed their story and they did a lot of research on that story. And then I had them tell their stories as if they were um, that person who did that. And I think giving kids the tools to try to sympathize and try to almost like empathize with them a little bit. Um, I think that was really cool, and it gave them, again, the perspective of somebody that doesn't look like them, doesn't speak the same language as them, is totally different than them, so, yeah. So, also, there's um, a really cool article that I was given when I was um, about y'all's age, when I was in high school, I think I was senior in high school, and my, uh, my teacher, we were learning about culture, and he gave us this article to read about a, a culture from some faraway place, I don't know, and we were reading it, and we were like, man, this place is crazy like these people do all kinds of crazy stuff these women are putting their heads in ovens and they go to these like crazy tooth men and they're like drilling through their skulls like what the heck are, who are these people I don't know if you've ever read it. it's called the Nasarema and you read it and it sounds all crazy when you get to the end Nasarema spelled backwards is American or American and so um, I think that kind of that's something I use as a teacher also to kind of like open their eyes a little bit like okay I'm like maybe I should be reading things about other people in a different way and not just assume that because they're different, they're crazy, but like try to see myself from their um, perspective as, as much as I can. And so that was kind of a cool uh, resource that I was given a long time ago that I have carried with me. As a, as a young teacher, do you think it's hard for teachers starting off to diversify their curriculum? Absolutely. Um, I think that's probably one of the hardest things for for teachers to do coming in you are just bogged down as a new teacher and that's a whole separate conversation but um i mean new teachers come into the field and they have tons more training requirements than a veteran teacher does they have to meet all of these paperwork requirements and they have to be um like they have all these meetings with their administrators and um they're and all on top of just learning how to be a teacher and learning your content and uh, learning how, how to do anything. And so I think that gets, unfortunately, put on the back burner. Um, and that's, like I said earlier, like you're just trying to keep your head above water. And so trying to figure out how to correct the curriculum that's been given to you wrongly, I just think a lot of people don't have time for it. It's not necessarily their fault. They're just not given the tools to do it. So how do you think that Arkansas can progress in public education and provide these teachers with the right tools they need? Yeah, well, I think I think it starts with this, what you guys are doing. Like, let's talk about it. I'm going to be honest with you. I had a lot of this stuff. I, I feel like I have been kind of subconsciously trying to do, but like I have never sat down and been like, you know, like something needs to change here. And so I think this is the first step, I think, is talking about it and taking it somewhere. And then I think, I mean, I think the end goal would obviously be, like, 
the people working for the State Department, like they need to be doing better. They need to be giving teachers the tools. We also need to be training teachers um, on how to be inclusive and not have um, kind of those those biases about kids that they don't understand. I'm I'm gonna be honest. I have had one training on uh, implicit bias, and it was because I signed up for it, and it was online, and it was just kind of this random little. 10 minute thing that I did. And had I not even picked that one off of the big list, I have never been spoken to as a teacher about implicit bias. And I think that should be changed. I think we should be talking about it. Okay, do you have any advice for high schoolers who are looking to diversify what they read and learn from? Yeah, absolutely. I think the best advice I can give is to listen to people who are, who are talking, who are, who need their voices heard. Um, I think I mean, and I, this almost is contradictory because I'm like giving advice, but like as a white woman, I can't speak to the injustices of people of color. Um, so I think stop and I think ask somebody um, or talk to somebody who, who looks different than you, who acts different, who comes from a different family background than you. Um, if, if you're a male, like, ask a woman how some, how this make how did that make you feel like? Did you feel unsafe walking to your car at night from this place? Like, what can I do to help you? Or um, like, how can I help your voice be heard more? And so, and not that that's necessarily someone's responsibility to educate you themselves, but like, look around. If everyone you associate with looks exactly like you, like, do something different. Um, I have a, some, a family friend and they are, just good as gold and we they were our next door neighbors when I grew up in Springdale Arkansas and I never thought that they were different than me until well, I was probably 16 or 17 years old and uh, they had migrated here uh, from California but before that from Iran and uh, I mean we we just were kids and we were best friends and we would share holidays together and we would eat Thanksgiving together and we would say our my family, we, I was raised Christian, and we would sit at the table, and we would say our Christian prayer, and then they would say their Islamic prayer, and then we would eat, and that never was weird to me until I kind of grew up and was like, oh, people didn't mingle like that, like they should have been, and that's something I thank my mom for. She she raised us to, to not draw lines and to not see people differently, so I, again, just, I think Talk to people who are different than you. That's probably my best piece of advice. I know that, especially in English classes, it might be easier to implement um, authors from Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, but how does that, what does that look like in history classes or in human geography or classes that maybe don't focus their learning off of novels and books? Yeah, for sure. And, and you're right, it doesn't. And again, our perspective has just been taught from one group of people. Um, and it just, it takes some digging, and I think that's something that I would like to grow and do better at, is challenging students, like, listen, this history book that we've been given, it ain't it, <laughs> right, um, and so, like, do some digging, like, let's try to find perspectives from other people, and it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be what's, what's right in front of us, but, in, like, trying to incorporate more of that I guess kind of like research mindset, which that's what we should be teaching kids because as an adult now, if I'm scrolling through social media and I see so-and-so posted this fact, like I'm not gonna just accept that and move on with my life. Like I want to I want to find that for myself and make sure that that is truth. And that's what we should be teaching kids to do. Um, is like, you find it for yourself and you find what the truth is. Um, and that, again, that's hard. That's not easy, but I think that's something that that we should or could be trying harder to do in history. So, so being a teacher in like a predominantly um, white school, um, it, do you ever like face conflict with other teachers who might think like diversifying curriculum is bad or um, just like not having many people of color as teachers and like representation? Um, like how do you deal with that or what tips do you have for other teachers going through that? I haven't really had a ton of pushback from other teachers really. Um, I'm sure that if the conversation came up, I'm sure that would have happened. Um, I think the most, 
most of kind of the tension came from students uh, who who did not want it to be done like that and um, who said like well I don't agree that you won't let us use the word gay like I because I, that, that was one that's one of my rules it's like we shouldn't be using somebody's characteristic to show our disdain of something like no we're not going to talk like that and so they're like well I don't, I don't like that and they do it anyways or they kind of say well well I don't I don't understand why you're kind of dogging on the founding fathers so much like that and so that's really where most of it came from uh was just from students and a, and a lot of times that comes from parents that's just what they've been taught um and so I don't know I think tr just being very cordial and civil and just trying to help them understand why the why not like it's because I said so that's why you can't say it or they weren't the best guys out there because I said so like teaching them why like this is why the founding father like they weren't perfect right like we have a lot of things to be thankful in this country for in this country but like it wasn't all, all that good um and so I think just teaching them the why um is the biggest thing and I did I had some parents kind of push back at times who would call to the school and say well this teacher is telling my kid that that that's really the biggest thing it, it didn't most it it's just something that I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of tension from a couple of kids and a couple of parents for, for the overall good of ha having open conversations and being truthful. And I think a lot of history teachers aren't very truthful about history and it's easier to tell the, the whitewash side of it, but yeah. Where you're talking with kids about um, people's experiences, just how living in a certain, with a certain skin color, a certain characteristic um, impacts their life differently. Do you ever get people who push back and say that that's like a political statement to make whenever you're talking about just like the rights of different groups of people? Oh my gosh, yes, absolutely. Um, and so, at, especially as a government teacher, I, I went into it um, and I said on the first day, y'all, we're going to get into a lot of controversial stuff. We're going to, we're going to do this thing because I think it's necessary that we talk about it. I'm just going to let you know right now, like, I'm not going to tell you my political opinions. Um, I'm going to give you both sides of the story. And one of those sides I might not always agree with, but I'm going to give it to you anyways, um, because I want you to figure it out on your own. I want you to figure it out. My mom is an angel on earth and she raised me and she never once told me until I was an adult like what her political affiliations were because she wanted me to figure it out for myself and not just because my parent told me that's what it was um, which I'm so thankful and so that's something I wanted to do in my classroom but I would still get parents who would call the school and say well that social studies teacher is spreading liberal propaganda to my student or my kid and I was like well I literally never even said when I was well, it's in here, but um, I mean, yeah, I think I think a lot of times it's perceived as being political, um, and that's the pro. I mean, that's a problem. I feel like if we're talking about human rights, there's nothing political about that. We are talking about the experiences of people, of humans. Of it does not matter what skin color or sexual orientation they are. Like, it's their human rights for. Like, oh my gosh, that's just that's crazy to me, but. Yeah, a lot of times it is taken as a political stance, but I don't, that's just, again, one of those, one of those things you just have to accept. If, I feel like if you're going to do it right, you're just going to accept that people aren't always going to understand it. Kind of going off of that, um, so you teach high school students, and high school students usually come into high school with perceived notions and perceived ideals about things. So how do you come as like a form of an educator to talk about something that they probably already have ideas I about? I try my best to try to tell them always to keep an open mind. That only goes so far. They're either going to take it or they're going to listen or they're not going to listen to that piece of advice. But um, I mean, I always, I give them like a political spectrum quiz at the beginning of the year. Like you might not even know if this question is asking you, just do your best. And then at the end of the year, kind of take it again after they've accumulated some knowledge about ideas rather than just, well, I heard my mom and my dad say something about this that they saw on the news. Um, and it, it changes a lot of times. And a lot of times it doesn't change. And that's fine too. But um, I don't know. I had a student and he came into my class kind of, I think he, he was like, I, I already know. Like, I already know who, what's going on here. Like, I have my opinions already. Like, I don't really need to be taught about anything. At the end of the semester, I overheard him having a conversation with a girl um, 
about a super like super controversial issue on the opposite on um, totally opposite and just but then like he you told somebody he was like I wasn't really very respectful how you responded to her so like I think it would be more respectful if you kind of said it this way I was like oh my god <laughs> right so um I don't know I think giving kids the facts a lot of times will help them kind of see like, okay, well, what do I think about this? Um, and sometimes it's not, and that's fine too. But it, I, again, I can sleep at night knowing like I tried to, to give kids the facts and I am so content and I am happy if they, with whatever it is that they think about government or the world, if they have thought about it themselves, they have read facts and then they can make a decision Cool. I know a lot of people sometimes will be stuck in their ways and even when they see new information they kind of get defensive and feel like they're not allowed to change their mind. So do you have any advice for normalizing changing your mind when you get new information? Yeah I think and I think this is kind of a conversation that's happening kind of right now in our world is a lot of people are coming out and saying um, kind of like with the um, like Black Lives Matter I think a lot of people are coming out and saying like hey, I need to just fess up and say like previously what I said, not super cool or the way I said it or the way I thought, like not cool, but I'm here now, I'm joining the conversation and I would like to fix it. And I think once we can normalize, like, I don't know, like it being okay to change your mind, I feel like we are really like judgmental on people for what they said in the past. And sometimes we need to be, right, with our, with some, people in positions where that's kind of a big thing but like I don't know I think normalizing apologizing and you know saying like I, I'm growing and I'm changing I think that's good I think that's going to come from a lot of leadership once students can see leaders in our state and in our community and in our government doing that I think that's going to help a lot. I was wondering with Black Lives Matter, the whole movement and recognizing these issues of systemic oppression in our country, in our world, what do you think or perceive as kids come back to school this fall, even if it's online, what that's going to look like in addressing those kind of like microaggressions in the classroom? That's a good question. I don't, I can be 100%, I don't exactly know yet. I think that's something that I can sit here and I can sue on it and I can try to find an answer. And then as soon as I walk into a classroom, a kid's going to hit me with something. I'm going to be like, I didn't think you were going to say that. Um, so I think, I think it's just something that we're just going to have to figure out as we go. I think, again, having a lot of open communication um, and allowing students whose, whose voices or their their families or their ancestors' voices who haven't always been heard, I think allowing them to speak is going to be really important. And it, that takes a lot, a lot, a lot of like foundational work to create a culture where kids feel comfortable to speak and they don't feel pressured to speak or they don't feel, um, I don't know, like there's always a conversation. I feel like when, when you're teaching about slavery in, in history class, all the kids look at the black kid in the room, right? Like we have to get away from that. And so that we're, it's like a conversation and not like we're talking about you, right? It should, it doesn't need to be like that. And that takes a lot of groundwork. And that's, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge this year is if we don't get to go back that relationship building, that ground, that foundation level that we're, we need to lay, that's going to be super hard to, to create. Um, and so Again, we'll just have to figure it out as we go. Um, I would, I hope that it comes up. I, I hope, I think, that, again, that's what, I feel like I'm making a difference in that respect. Um, and so when things have, they've gotten so huge, which thank God they need, this is way past due for people to finally be heard and for things to be happening. Um, and I kind of, I sit here and I'm like, what can I be doing? What can I be doing more? Like. Um, should I, should I be posting on social media more? Should I be doing this? Should I be donating more money? Should, what should I do? And then I kind of have to realize like your job is how you're doing it. Um, and so like when you go to work, if you do everything in your power to try to create that culture and try to teach kids 
what's right and what's wrong. Like that's how you're helping. Um, so I, I hope it comes up. I was just wondering like, how can people, like how can educators or just people with young children, like how can, do you have any ideas or just ways to start off at like a young level um, or young age to like diversify what they're thinking about? Yeah, um, I think, I think that the tools are so much more readily available today than they used to be. Um, and so like I've talked to Anna, my best friend is an elementary teacher and uh, we were browsing Target, you know how people in their 20s be browsing Target. Um, and so we always stop in the book section to see what books she needs to add to her, her classroom library for her second graders. And the last time we stopped, I was just like in awe. I was like, look at all these books, like about like strong women and about people of color and about uh, people who are immigrants. And I was just like, none of this was here when we were kids. Um, and so I think exposing children uh, to diverse perspectives, like what we've been talking about, I think that's our biggest thing. Um, uh, that's our biggest asset in trying to help kids early on. Um, and to not, we're not teaching kids color blindness. We're not teaching them that boys will be boys. No, like we need to be teaching them about how certain people are oppressed and what can we do to fix it? How can you, when you're on the playground and you see something happening, like, what can you do, right? So we should be teaching them like what to do, not just everybody's equal and it's roses and flowers and everything's good. Like everything's not good. <laughs> so like teaching kids to be problem solvers, I guess, and, and really opening their eyes to different, different perspectives. I'm curious to know how you discuss with someone that hasn't seen or heard of or experienced certain sides or what maybe other people are saying they've experienced. I know some people will say, I've never experienced it, so it can't be true. Yeah. So what kind of discussions and conversations do you have with those kind of people? Yeah, I think, and this is where I feel like I need to be quiet um, because again, maybe, maybe I can't, I, maybe I can't speak to it. Maybe I can, but most of the time I can't. And so it's hard to, if I, I can try to explain it, it's, I'm not going to do it very good. Um, and so I use a ton of, like, I don't know, my, my students are probably like, man, Miss Oliver just shows videos all the time. But, but it's because I feel like, I feel like other people can, can say it better. And like, it's, I don't know, it's just better for kids to hear it from somebody firsthand. And so when we're talking about a uh, gender side, um, that's happening a lot in India and a lot in China and people are killing their infant daughters because that's not what's socially, um, I don't know, like preferred. I can stand there and talk about it all day, but if I pull, if I show you a video of a woman who's, whose husband and in-laws pushed her down a flight of stairs to force her to miscarry her infant daughter that was still in gestation and you see her and you, and you can hear her voice, you know, that makes a way bigger impact. Um, if I can show you a video of, of small children working in factories to make your shoes, like that's, that's gonna make a bigger impact. So again, I think it's where I need to be quiet um, and let other people talk. For non-black folk or people who aren't um, like women or people of color, and you kind of touched on this already, but um, I guess for them, maybe if there's, they've recognized their privilege and they don't, they're unsure of how they can speak up about these issues. Do you have any advice for how they can amplify the voices of others? Yeah, um, I think we are super, super um, advantaged right now because I feel like since this is a very widely talked about thing right now, I think a lot of people have worked really hard to uh, give resources on like what can I do to be an ally or what can I do um, to make sure that that I'm that I'm helping or that I'm speaking in a way that's going to amplify your voice um, and so I think that's just where people are gonna if you don't like to read you better get over it because you need to do a lot of reading and I think I think that sharing that and social media is great. I think social media is such an amazing thing when, when used correctly to share things like that. 
um, those, those types of resources. And so I really encourage young people to, to keep doing that, to share um, with other, your, the resources that you find. Like we shouldn't be finding them and keeping them for ourselves. If you find something great, like absolutely share it. Chant, what, worst case scenario, somebody clicks past it and moves on with their day. Best case scenario, one person clicks on it, learns something and can be better the next day. Um, so I think that, I think that's really our, the internet, especially in a time where we're fairly stuck at home, the internet's going to kind of be our saving grace. So. Thank you so much, Shelby, for talking with us today about diversifying education. We really appreciate it and the perspective you've brought. Throughout this series, we will be creating a list of different resources to help push forward the conversation about systemic racism and the topics that we will be discussing in these videos in schools. We'll send our list to the Arkansas Department of Education, encouraging them to make these resources accessible to teachers in our state. If you have any recommendations of books, podcasts, videos, etc., to add to this list, please feel free to share them in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more content from Loud Women, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like this video. You can find more of us on loudwomencommunity.org or on our Instagram page at loudwomencommunity. If you would like to stay up to date on Loud Women events, sign up for our weekly newsletter in the description box below. Check back on July 31st for our discussions on voter education and voter suppression. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.